household with my mom, who's a smoker, my dad's a former smoker, uh, grandparents, on and on and on, generations beyond that have used tobacco, but I never thought uh, critically about how did that come to be, what impact is that having? I, um, I started smoking when I was about 10. I mean, that's what's so complicated is that the addiction. Initially, it was just fun. Uh, we continued to smoke. My habit, you know, increased. So it has been a struggle. We are the top leading organization who really sets out the advocacy agenda to come against the tobacco industry in the U.S. So in the black community, the statistics about tobacco use, they're devastating, actually. There are 45,000 people a year, African Americans, who die from smoking-related diseases. These diseases stem from heart disease, cancer, stroke, and uh, are, are really just the morbidities that exist in our African-American community because of smoking. It's no coincidence that my family smokes cigarettes or has used tobacco and particularly menthol cigarettes. My mom smokes menthol cigarettes. And learning that that is not just, you know, a personal preference, but that was actually targeted and in, in the, uh, the industry was very intentional in targeting black communities with this flavor. I can remember them coming into the neighborhood, passing out free cigarettes, and it was Newport's. Uh, Newport Menthol uh, Light were a new product, it was a new product, and they were actually targeting our neighborhood and bringing cigarettes in. So the Tobacco Free Kids organization has been around for 25 years now. We're celebrating that 25th year anniversary our mission uh, of the Tobacco Free Kids is to eradicate smoking globally. We've done that by really focusing on that next generation to end smoking there. So we're, we're focused on, on kids. My eldest son was born in 1990 when he reached seven or eight-ish. Um, and he just broke down crying. And you know, I asked him what was wrong and he said, well, Dad, you always tell me what to do, but you never do what I tell you to do. So I was like, well, what did you tell me to do, buddy? And he's like, I want you to quit smoking. I made the internal uh, commitment to quit smoking. My mom smoked from teenage years to June 6, 1981. And the reason I remember that day is it was my high school graduation. And she asked what would I want for graduation. And I said, Mom, the best gift you could give me is to not smoke, give up cigarettes. My mom has not smoked since that day. My role in the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids, working with the youth advocacy team, is basically, basically to support our outreach to communities of color, especially youth, um, growing through partnerships with organizations. We are committed to confronting the tobacco industries um, preying on communities that have been marginalized. Specifically within the African-American community, we are building a coalition of members who will help us to engage, to educate, and to uh, actually spread the word within their communities on this devastating product. Good evening, good evening, good evening. It's so uh, great to have you all here join us this evening. My name is John Burns. I am the managing partner at the Burns Brothers and I am beyond honored to moderate today's conversation on the intergenerational 
uh, tobacco use and its cultural impact on Black communities. Um, and this is going to be a dynamic conversation with some incredible, incredible leaders across different industries and sectors, all really focused on empowering, mobilizing, and impacting around a tobacco control specific to communities of color. Um, and this is uh, the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids inaugural event and a larger series called the Campaign for the Culture, which is gonna have dynamic conversations such, such as this, an HBCU listening tour, a virtual summit, um, advocate profiles amongst other things. And it's really focused on really mobilizing communities. So we're so happy to have you all here with us tonight um, for a very impactful conversation. And we just saw an incredible video. And one of the people featured in that video is going to be the first guest uh, joining us for this conversation. Um, her name is Portia Reddick White. Uh, Portia is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Welcome, Portia. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. And, and Portia, thank you for all the great work that you are doing, that the organization is doing with respect to tobacco control and communities of color. I think obviously we know the plight of communities of color, especially now, is more is more significant than ever. And so thank you for all the work that you're doing. You mentioned in the video, 25 years of service. Talk to about the engagement, the mobilization, what you all are doing as an organization specific to engaging and mobilizing black communities. Well, thank you. We are committed to building awareness within the African-American, the black community of all the tactics that the tobacco uh, industry has used to, to push their predatory tactics on the uh, black community. Our goal is to provide the best quality of information, resources, and advocacy tools um, for individuals, organizations, and decision makers. Um, we're having conversations like this one this evening, and it's critical on building steps toward building community support for the policy actions that we know have the greatest impact in closing the racial health gap in the country and banning the sale of all flavored tobacco, including all menthol, pro uh, menthol products, uh, that would be a major step in the right direction. So we're doing this uh, to fight against the tobacco industry and we do need the members of the black community who've been impacted by these predatory tactics uh, to, to listen, to stand with us so that we can uh, start helping save black lives. Yeah, no, Portia, I couldn't agree with you more. And you mentioned some dynamic leaders that we will be hearing from very shortly, but you also mentioned menthol and its infiltration and targeted infiltration into black communities. And mm -hmm. um, I want to bring up a statistic from a study from 2013. It says a study from uh, found that African-American kids were three times more likely to recognize a Newport cigarette, which obviously menthol based menthol based ad than kids of other races and Newports are priced lower in African-American neighborhoods across all 50 states. How do we stop tobacco ads from polluting black neighborhoods? Well, look, it's no coincidence that uh, African-American youth, black youth, are, uh, that they recognize ads uh, from popular menthol cigarette brands like Newport. It's a direct result of the decades of pervasive targeted marketing aimed at the black communities. Uh, the marketing actually has been horrifyingly successful. Um, in the 1950s, less than 10% of black smokers used menthol cigarettes. Today, that number has grown. 85% of black smokers smoke menthol cigarettes. And so one of the most despicable tactics taken by the tobacco companies has been their targeting of potential customers with heavy in-store marketing and significantly uh, lowering prices in predominantly black neighborhoods. I think the... Uh, the, the video before this actually spoke about that. It's cheaper in black neighborhoods. So we've got to stop uh, the tobacco company from polluting black com uh, communities like this. And to do that, we've got to take menthol products and all flavored tobacco products off the shelf. Right, right. No, well, well, Portia, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your work. Um, I'm going to have you exit now, but we look forward to having you rejoin the conversation momentarily. But thank you so much, Portia. Really appreciate your insight. And I'm so um, enthusiastic to invite the next guest to join the conversation. I'd like to kind of bring up uh, Dr. Leon McDougal. Dr. McDougal is the president of the National Medical Association. Would also like to join um, Shana Davis, uh, senior program director at the Black Women's Health Imperative, and Mr. Lincoln Monday, associate director of strategic projects at Advocates for Youth. Uh, I think uh, Shana should, there she is, there she is. 
good to see you all. Hope you're all staying well. Good to see you all. Um, good to Dr. see you. McDougal. Thanks for having us. Wonderful. Good to see you, Lincoln. Dr. McDougall, I want to start with you. As president of the NMA, you are, are tasked with obviously mobilizing communities of African-American physicians across the country. How can African-American physicians effectively outreach to their communities to really prevent the cycle of tobacco use in Black communities from continuing? Excellent question. So one would be to join you and tobacco-free kids in the advocacy effort to end menthol-containing tobacco products. And organizations such as this are so important. Remember back when we had that big tobacco settlement uh, in regards to tobacco companies losing lawsuits in regards to how they marketed tobacco uh, in the, long ago. What happened in my state? So that tobacco settlement money was supposed to be used for prevention. And guess what? They used it to balance the state budget. So it just disappeared. So it shows you how valuable your work is. So I would say physicians joining and locking arms with tobacco-free kids and other similar organizations to advocate for elimination of menthol and to stop kids from smoking. Mm -hmm. it, it, Dr. McDougall, I couldn't agree with you more. You talk about the importance of partnership, right? You talked about the importance of collective action because as a unified front, we are much more powerful together. And Shannon, uh, I was Sean, I want to bring you into the conversation here and kind of talk about all the great work you're doing with Black Women's Health Imperative. And I, I know we're all very familiar with the organization. I'm super familiar. And for folks that don't know, talk a little bit about Black Women's Health Imperative, your mission, your objectives, but also talk about what you all are doing as an organization to really combat some of these challenges around communities of color, specifically African-American community, communities and tobacco use. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Uh, at the Black Women's Health Imperative, our work focuses singularly on improving health outcomes for Black women and girls. So we've, we've learned more this evening about the pernicious marketing tactics of the big tobacco industry. And at the Black Women's Health Imperative, we are working to overcome these hurdles by focusing on young women through education, advocacy, and leadership efforts. Uh, specifically, we've started a new program called CS, and we're fighting for a more just society for Black women on HBCU campuses, and by extension, their communities, and making sure that they are equipped with healthy emotional wellness and advocacy skills while building their leadership capacity to unapologetically fight against big tobacco and fight for themselves, their futures, and for their communities. Mm -hmm. No, Shauna, that's, that's wonderful. And the work that you all are doing as an organization is tremendously important. And you mentioned, obviously, the objectives, or one of the objectives of the organization is to really mobilize and um, uplift and empower young Black women and young Black girls as well. And I know, Lincoln, I want to bring you into the conversation because I think, first of all, brother, I'm so proud of you, all the great work that you are doing and that you continue to do and advocate for your community, advocate for us all. Um, I want you to share a little bit about your documentary. I had a chance to watch it, obviously. Very, very important work that you're doing. Uh, Black Lives, Black Lungs. Share about that. Talk about your work and how uh, you learned the, the process of, of creating the documentary and kind of how you think outreach could it be done better or how are we currently doing outreach specific to Black communities? Thank you so much, John, and the campaign for having me. And Dr. McDougal, Mc, sorry, McDougal and Shauna, it's so nice to be in conversation with you all tonight. Um, as John said, my name is Lincoln Mundy and I design campaigns and videos and strategies really all focused on young people's health and power. So Advocates for Youth, that focuses around their sexual and reproductive health and rights. So sex ed and LGBTQ health and rights and spaces. And for uh, my work with Truth Initiative, that really focuses on the health and the well-being of the black community, specifically when it comes to um, menthol when it comes to institutions uh, not only attacking us but also using us and um, leveraging us not only us but our trauma and our um, anxiety valid anxieties with medical institutions with police 
um, really to their advantage. So uh, I got kind of really <laughs> pissed off about this, frankly, in 2015 when I was a fellow at Truth Initiative. And I just wanted to see if other people knew kind of how big tobacco infiltrated the black communities. And a lot of my peers did it. They had the same questions that I was having um, because I grew up in a rural part of Texas and my black father and family exclusively smoked menthol, but my white mother and my white family used chewy tobacco or smoked non-menthol. Mm -hmm. So we all had these questions of why menthol was so ingrained in black culture. And so I set out to ask the experts, ask the black public health experts who've been talking about this and leading this for decades, their opinion. And that's my film. It's really documenting, you know, how big tobacco infiltrated our community, not only philanthropically, but through uh, political ways, through cultural ways and things like that. So I'm excited to be here with you all tonight and do this work alongside all of you. Well, 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 thank you, Lincoln. You're doing tremendous work and it's it's very important. So we really appreciate that. And, and Dr. McDougall, I want to kind of pivot back to you and let's talk more here about some of the specific health issues, right? So we think about um, chronic illnesses such as diabetes and high blood pressure. And now we're living in an environment of a global pandemic called COVID-19. How does smoking, just for folks that might not know, how does smoking impact some of those chronic illnesses and then specifically maybe speak to chronic uh, to COVID-19 as well? So uh, good question. Since we're speaking to a younger audience, let's speak to what happens to younger people. Uh, and uh, for those uh, teenage parents or younger parents who have a child, your child is more likely to develop ear infections. Your child is more likely to have breathing problems. And not only that, yourself may uh, experience problems with breathing and shortness of breath or worsening of any underlying uh, respiratory, respiratory ailment you ailment. may have, such as uh, asthma. And what we know about COVID-19, uh, the total uh, name of it is uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. So it is a respiratory transmitted infection through your breath mostly or, uh, or you know, coughing. And those are some of the major ways that it is transmitted. And then if that person who develops an illness has lung damage because they've been smoking, it makes it more likely that you may have to be hospitalized and perhaps placed on a breathing machine. And we know when people are placed on a breathing machine from COVID, your chances of survival are a lot less. Oh, no, Dr. McDougall, I appreciate that. And I, I have one more question, kind of a follow-up question. When you think about, obviously, tobacco use, intergenerational use, I mean, that's the topic and theme of today's conversation. There's a stat that says secondhand smoke kills 41,000 Americans a year, right? So black children and adults are more likely to be exposed to secondhand smoke than any other racial or ethnic group. What are the effects of secondhand smoke on the body? And how do we convince parents that secondhand smoke is really harmful? What can we do to really stop this cycle? So very good question. Secondhand smoke is just like the family is smoking with you. And also it makes it so if you have two people in a family, let's say a married couple, one is trying to quit and the other one is smoking. It just makes it that much more difficult to stop smoking. So I know in my home growing up, my dad smoked, my brother had asthma. It was a bad, it was a bad combination. So uh, it, it's, it's just makes things that secondhand smoke is real. And if you don't smoke, and then even if somebody walks by you that's a smoker, you can smell it. It's on your clothes, it's in the house, it's everywhere. Right. No, no. And I, I think that's very important information for folks to know. When we think about, again, this intergenerational piece, it's very important that secondhand smoke um, can be as harmful as just smoking yourself. And so I think that's really important to, to kind of make sure the viewers and the audience, everybody who might be listening to share that information with their community, with your family. So everybody's very aware 
of the dangers and harm involved in secondhand smoke. Shane, I want to pivot back to you, or Sean, excuse me. I want to pivot back to you. When we know now we're about almost a month in to the new Biden-Harris administration, what kind of public health policies should we be pushing the new administration when it comes to combating tobacco, the tobacco crisis? Well, John, you know, the, the focus remains the same. It's really about protecting the health of Black Americans and holding the administration accountable for doing that. You know, we are working with other organizations like the campaign to call on the FDA to use its authority to ban tobacco products with menthol along with other flavored tobacco products. And until the FDA acts, we're gonna continue to push until Congress takes action. The time has come to stop the tobacco industry from preying on our community. And, you know, we also need to do a lot to support um, black smokers and their desires to quit. We need to expand the availability of treatments, of services, and we need to make sure that these services are visible and accessible to the people who need them. We also need to ensure that smoking cessation medications and counseling are fully covered by Medicaid, as well as private health plans. And, you know, as, as Dr. McDougall said, you can pick almost any major health concern in the Black community, and um, smoking has a role in it. At the Black Women's Health Imperative, we also want to make sure that the reproductive impacts of smoking are brought to the forefront. You know, we know that smoking-related illnesses impact uh, birth weights. We know that it impacts premature births. We know that it impacts the overall um, efficacy when we're talking about um, the cellular makeup of eggs and sperms coming together to produce healthy babies. So, you know, we are absolutely at the point where we really need to hold this administration accountable and really work with them to move forward this agenda. I think that's vitally important information. Um, just because we're all in this kind of together as we get used to this new administration. So it's good to have some background, some insight around all the great work that you're doing, the organization's doing as we combat these challenges together. So thank you for sharing that. Lincoln, kind of as the youth expert in this space, and we think about, again, this intergenerational piece, um, I think it's so vitally important. Talk to us about the pressures, right? Is it coming from peers? Is it coming from family members? What are really some of the pressures that young people, especially young people of color, are experiencing today? And talk to me about how they can overcome some of those pressures. I think it's a great question. I think uh, there's a lot of pressures. I also think, you know, as a space, as a tobacco control space, public health, we need to understand that, you know, young people are not siloed in their issues. You, you know, like we know that a young person's race, sexual orientation, zip code, status, everything really impacts their not only physical health, but their mental and emotional health as well. And it's really about understanding where young people are coming from and the traumas that they're going through each day, the stresses that they're going through, whether it's uh, stress and anxiety from state violence or police brutality, or whether it's, you know, a valid mistrust or anxiety with the medical industry as a Black community, right? So specifically, I think with this issue, we need to understand that young people are looking at, at, to check institutions, right? Young people are looking to make sure that they're investing in institutions that care, that don't, that don't oppress their community, right? So from my perspective, and this is kind of the core of my work, I focus on institutions and not individual level characters, right? I think we get lost in the individual uh, in the mi micro and we're forgetting all of the pressures and the uh, institutions at play that are against young people, whether it's giving them the respect they deserve, the responsibility they deserve, or the health and resources, right? So I think young people are looking for holistic health. They're looking for not only organizations to care about their physical well-being when it comes to tobacco control, but also to care about whether their community is being executed by state violence, right? We need to understand that a young person's health 
uh, and wellness is all intertwined. And I think in 2015, when I started having ideas and thoughts from Black leaders, from Truth Initiative to AATLC to other people who've been doing the work, I don't think that the space has been intentional enough to really invest in Black community and Black-led campaigns and organizations, because that's where the winds are coming from, right? That's where uh, parents and faith leaders and advocates are coming together to say no to big tobacco, to say no to institutions doing us harm. So I think as we go into this work, having all of those factors in mind is really critical for the health and well-being of young people, specifically Black people. Right. No, Lincoln, and, and you brought up a really, really good point. I mean, the the experience of young people of color, it's it's not it's very dynamic, right? And so can you just expand when you think about, you, you mentioned like the, the number of different variety of reasons that could lead someone, especially a young person of color to use tobacco. What have you heard? I know there's a number of different things, but what kind of are the most, re, most kind of reasons that you hear the most or why young people start using tobacco? Well, I, again, don't focus on the individual level. So I'll leave, you know, the trends and the research to the experts. But I think when we get bogged down in the individual peer pressures or kind of how they're starting, I think we forget the larger kind of decades long uh, systems that have been in place to get, you know, uh, black neighborhoods more littered with menthol products, to get black neighborhoods more, uh, more, you know, connected to the, to the, to big tobacco through their political organizations, through their political leaders, right? We need to understand that for decades, there's been such a strong, financial and system and power approach from Big Tobacco to make sure that, you know, their future is sustainable. So e-cigarettes are just another path for them to make sure that the industry lasts, right? There's been so many wins across the board, thanks to the Truth Initiative, thanks to the campaign, thanks to all the Black-led organizations, thanks to Dr. Phil Gardner and Dr. Valerie Yerger and Carol Magruder and all the people who've been, again, for decades, ringing the alarm about the impacts of tobacco on Black communities. I'm glad that we're finally, hopefully, leading towards a more res kind of resolution when it comes to listening and investing in resources and resourcing Black experts. But I think, you know, it's important to also understand everything at play. So uh, while I've heard things when I've been screening my films about, you know, just thinking that menthol was a black people thing, thinking it was cool, right? Dave Chappelle has menthol jokes. We, it's more kind of ingrained that you have the cool jazz festival, right? Big Tobacco is donated to Black Sony and like so many different connections to where the tobacco industry has made an effort to be there in times when young people are stressed, in times when young people are looking and searching for different things to soothe, when young people are looking just to see what it's like because they're seeing it on TV or reading about or hearing their friends, I think that is where we need to kind of understand the context before getting to kind of the peer pressure aspect of it. Yep. No, no, Lincoln, that's a very in, a great insight. So thank you for sharing that. And uh, before we transition to the next segment, I, I just want to ask Dr. McDougall and Shauna one more question. Dr. McDougall, I know you talked about some of the health uh, concerns specific to around COVID-19 and, and diabetes and obviously high blood pressure that uh, smoking and tobacco use can attribute to those. But what are some of the other um, effects, that may, whether it be physical or mental, that could be uh, cause development, you know, just in the development of children that we might need to be concerned about from a tobacco use standpoint? So uh, Lincoln brought up something that really connects to this question. And I'm not certain whether you're going to talk about this on your next panel, but vaping and flavored inhalation, that's damaging young people's lungs, whether it be menthol. Actually, one of my patients said uh, he was able to order a marshmallow flavored vaping. And as you know, people have been dying from that. So in addition, so I want, so that vaping electronic cigarettes using tobacco administered electronically and then adding flavor to that, that's not safe. So I just wanna get that out there to the young people because they think that's a safe flavored vaping is an alternative, whether it be menthol or whatever. <laughs> flavor they put in it. So thank you, Lincoln, for bringing uh, that up. So, 
you can develop circulation problems. Um, and we talked earlier, so I won't go into my horror stories about people being so addicted <laughs> to to tobacco that uh, they've lost limbs, right? Well, I guess I will since I'm talking about it now. So I had a patient, uh, she was asked to stop smoking. We provided the patches and all that. She could not stop smoking. So they chopped one leg off and still couldn't stop smoking and chopped the other leg off. So, so I'm just, so this tobacco addiction and she started young. So it's real. And, uh, and I think young people think, you know, they're not thinking about when they live to be 60, right. Or, they're not thinking about it. They're thinking about right now. And that's what most older people say. I didn't think I was going to live this long. <laughs> if I did, I would have cared for myself better. So I, that's, that's how I'd like to speak. Hopefully I'm speaking to at least some of your questions. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, sorry. I, I think that's a great point, Dr. McDougall. I think when we're talking about e-cigarettes and we're talking about these things, looking at it from the context of the industry is important and helpful because you know what did the big tobacco do when they started losing in courts around where they could advertise right like big tobacco experiences a lot of regulations thanks to the people who are maybe watching now thanks to the people who are on this panel with me thanks to people in our space right but in their boardrooms they're thinking about how they would sustain the future so these new devices from startup from silicon valley california these USB devices, they attract young people and they attract kids and that's their intent because the big tobacco was losing on so many fronts around traditional cigarettes. You know, it's kind of public knowledge at this point that yes, yes. smoking is bad for your health, but e-cigarettes is their new lane. Big tobacco is just growing even bigger. Mm -hmm. No, no, Lincoln, I think that was a great addition and Dr. McDougall, Lincoln, thank you for all these great insights. and. And Shana, or Shana, excuse me, one more question for you. And we, we think about, and there's a, a stat here. If there was a nationwide tobacco ban in the U.S., an estimated 47% of African-Americans who smoke would quit. That means hundreds of thousands of lives would be saved, one third of them African-American lives. Do you think that is a realistic goal to strive for? Well, John, well, I think that would be wonderful. Um, I see it as highly unrealistic. I think we've seen over the, uh, the last year, time and time again, that our, our healthcare system is plagued with inequities. And in general, it's a system with many cracks and really would not be able to handle the load to ramp up to connect this volume of individuals um, with adequate cessation programs and other supports. Um, you know, and I, I feel like until our society is truly a just society and one that ensures that all people, regardless of race or ethnicity, are protected, that the resources that would be needed to do something like this and execute it successfully would not be equally available and distributed to black and brown communities. So while I, I think that this would be um, an admirable um, goal to reach. I just don't think that our country, our healthcare system is in a place to really support something like that right now. Well, 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 thank you, Shauna, for that insight. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Thank you, Lincoln. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, that was an incredible way to start today's conversation. I want to just move swiftly into our next segment as well. We have another group of dynamic, dynamic leaders. I would like to welcome Derek Johnson, President and CEO of the NAACP, Dr. Kimberly Jeffries Leonard, National President of the Lynx Incorporated, Carol Magruder, Co-Chair of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, and Bria Campbell, Truth Ambassador at the Truth Initiative. Good evening, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Well, good evening. Well, you, you guys have a tough act to follow, but I think this group <laughs> is well equipped to do it. So I really, really appreciate you guys joining us for what's already a very, very dynamic conversation. And Derek, I just kind of want to jump into it with you, um, kind of just leading off here. 
obviously NAACP, incredible, incredible organization, a storied history of just advocacy, mobilizing African-American communities for, for, for decades. What is the NAACP doing to combat the tobacco, tobacco crisis? Well, uh, we have a very clear position uh, against tobacco, particularly for kids. And most recently, uh, we adopted a resolution to oppose flavored tobacco. I can recall growing up in the inner city of Detroit, uh, and you've seen tobacco signs everywhere. It was uh, Joe Cool, uh, Cool Cigarettes, and Joe Campbell, I mean. I mean. Uh, and it was an enticement for people to start smoking. And I also recall the tobacco lawsuit and how the outcome of that lawsuit create uh, many tobacco uh, sensation groups. And we began to see the decline in the uh, people smoking cigarettes. In fact, it was so noticeable that when I was traveling abroad, I seen more people smoking in Europe and on the African continent and in South America than I would see here in America. And I thought that was a great thing because we all know that uh, the tobacco was being infused with flavors to make it taste good. And then it was being infused with a uh, higher concentration of nic nicotine to get people addicted to it. And that resulted in so many in our community who were already lacking access to uh, quality health care to uh, form conditions over time uh, that was not healthy and it was hurting families deeply. Uh, I know what the drug ec epidemic did to our community. And I put uh, the smoking of cigarettes and the, the addictive nature of cigarettes in the same category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, Mr. Johnson, I, I completely agree. And, and, and thank you, obviously, for the great work the organization is doing, you uh, as, in the leadership role. We, we really appreciate that. And I think it actually transitions nicely to, to my next question. I said, Dr. Jeffries Leonard, obviously you as national president, um, Dr. Jeffries Leonard a, a, of the Lynx, you are, are just doing some great work to mobilize your stakeholders, your membership. Talk to us about what you're doing to help engage and mobilize your members to really combat the tobacco crisis specific to how it's really infiltrating African-American communities. Thank you so much. We're so pleased to be here with the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. And, and actually, a lot of our partners are here on this um, this important uh, conversation tonight. We, we partner with the NAACP. We partner with the NMA. We partner with the Black Women's Health Imperative. And then, importantly, we're partnering with Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. And so we've heard now how the uh, tobacco industry has targeted uh, African-American communities, people of African descent. We've heard about the health impact of, of tobacco. We know that um, those diseases that are killing Black folks most are really definitely impacted by tobacco. And so when you look at this and you know that you're dealing with heart disease, you're dealing with cancer, you're dealing with the addiction, then, then what we have done is we've put programs in place that address uh, the, it, these issues, we've got uh, what we call a signature program that um, because the issue is so uh, pronounced and it's so it's not going away and it's impacting our community in such a, uh, um, a, a, a devastating way. We want to put standardized programs behind it. So we're fortunate that we have um, a, a, a longstanding and unfortunately that it's longstanding, Project Lead High Expectations, which is a program that addresses addiction, uh, substance use, uh, substance abuse, including tobacco in, in, in youth and adults. And this is really a critical issue. We have HeartLinks, which is a, a signature program because we know that tobacco use um, exacerbates cardiovascular disease. And we have a program that we work with the American Cancer Society, uh, Health, M, uh, Health Equity Ambassadors Links, that are addresses issues and education around uh, breast cancer, uh, lung cancer, colon cancer, because these cancers are impacted most by tobacco. But I think importantly, um, we have to, we're in continually to educate our members because they are the ambassadors in the community. We have over 16,000 members. And when you look at the outreach of these members into the communities, when you look at the program areas that we have services to youth, national trends and services, um, national trends and services, health and human services, all of these areas are impacted by tobacco use. And so when you have 16,000 women mobilized into the communities, working, doing programming across these, these areas, then that is the way that we're making an impact in the community around the issues of tobacco use. 
Well, 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 thank you, Dr. Jeffries Leonard, and, and thank you again for all the work that you're doing, uh, the Lynx Incorporated are doing. Um, Carol, I, I want to jump to you. The African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, obviously, um, the, the leadership there, you and the other uh, top brass there are doing incredible things in the organization around advocacy and mobilizing community. I, I want you to talk about some of your priorities, some of your objectives, but I also want you to kind of give some background on uh, why menthol is so popular. And I, we know we've talked about how it's been big tobacco infiltrated black communities, but give some context, kind of frame that for folks that might not be as familiar with the decades of ads and infiltration from big tobacco. Just yes. Some context for us. Yes. Well, first of all, good evening, everybody. I'm honored to be on the panel with you all. So I am the co-chair of the African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. And we have been at the forefront of the fight to get mentholated tobacco products out of the black community um, since our inception in 2008. And all of us have been working in commercial tobacco control longer than that. Um, I love the the our, our, our title of this conversation tonight because when we talk about uh, the generational impact impact. Um, in the past 20 years, we have lost almost 1 million Black people to tobacco-induced diseases. That's directly. That's not including all of the impacts from secondhand smoke and the people who die from that, but directly almost a million people. So when we talk about the generational impact, we, we have what we call um, irreparable Interge intergenerational harm that's been done to our community. And the people who are dying are our parents and our grandparents, the brains of our communities, the ones who, who guide us, who, who, who mend families, who take care of children, who educate people. Those are the people who die from tobacco-induced diseases. And when we talk about why this is so, why menthol, it's because of the predation of the tobacco industry for decades on our community. And that is multi-pronged. Um, it is very intentional. And we've seen this from um, the research from my esteemed colleague, our council member, Dr. Valerie Yerger and her team out of the University of California in San Francisco. And what we know about the tobacco industry is what has been gathered from their own internal tobacco industry documents that have been released from the millions of, millions of pages through literature Litigation. So we know how they studied us. We know how they have uh, used our leadership groups against us um, com through com complicitly and that that's still happening today. So I, I read an article that there's a that we have a cultural affinity to menthol. And so and I, I dare anyone who says that that we have a cultural affinity for mentholated tobacco products that people could say we have a cultural affinity for crack cocaine because that too was dumped in our community, it was made cheap, and it addicted our people. So addiction is about brain chemistry and access to populations. It's not about that black people are weak or that we, you know, we do have a lot of issues, but it's about these entities having access to us and to our children and addicting us at very young, or young ages. And Dr. McDougall talked, the younger you are when you're addicted, the more addicted you are and the harder it is to quit. Black people can quit. And we need to fight for that. We need to fight for services. We need to have many, many services. Um, and Lincoln talked about, when we talk about peer pressure, our children smoke for, for stress. You know, we did some focus groups in Sacramento with boys 13 to 18. Why are you doing this? Because our children are stressed out. So we need to deal with that. But we also need to stop the biggest predator in our community, which are these multinational tobacco companies, Reynolds, British American Tobacco, who, who have thrown these products in our communities, given them away to children. And now they sit back and say that it's racist for us to want to take these products offline and stop killing the 45,000 black people who die every year from these, from tobacco, from mentholated tobacco products. Does that answer it? <laughs> Carol, Carol, no, that, that definitely answers it. I think, you know, I think it's important to frame the conversation, right? I think it's important to have that context from the history of, of menthol and, 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 and some of your great insights. So I think it's very valuable. So thank you for that. And, and Bree, I want to bring you into the conversation, all your great work at the Truth Initiative. Talk to us about what you've done in engaging um, really uh, around outreach specific to African American communities in your role at the Truth Initiative. Yes, thank you so much um, for that uh, acknowledgement. It has been an amazing experience to be a truth ambassador and, you know, continue to work with them on, you know, all the efforts that they have. And as I was a truth ambassador, we, the thing I love about the ambassadors is that we all have 
different projects that are meant to address different issues all across the nation, you know, meet all types of demographics that are all still youth and are struggling with these um, with these issues. And so for my project specifically, I decided as a historically black college or university graduate, I wanted to really address issues that I saw with family members that I had, you know, seen smoke and maybe I know that friends of mine have been influenced to smoke or their family members too. And so with my project that I put together, I really said, how can we kind of how we're having a conversation today, but mine was tailored towards what are what is the context of why smoking has become and specifically menthols and things like that? Why has it become so pervasive in our community? But let's say you're a student who is a part of the black community, but you don't smoke, or maybe you are trying to help your family members stay healthy, but you just don't know where to start. So I really said, I want to give them these tools, help them to also learn from people who are working in this field and how they can be a part of that change. Because I believe that working to improve these issues is not just something that is, you know, working on physical health and, you know, emotional, and all those things. It also is a social justice issue. And I think that is something that connected with the students more than anything, because in the climate we're in right now, social justice issues are being focused on. Now is the time when we can really make an impact. And I'll say that the last thing is because of the project I've done, I've actually been able to um, hopefully incorporate it into the university that I recently graduated from. So not only did I begin to teach them, but that education can continue in the school and impacting the students to come. Wonderful, Brad. We are, we are so yeah. proud of you. Thank you for all the great work that you're doing. And, and thank you for sharing um, some of that with us. I, I think that's obviously very impactful, very valuable work that you're doing. So thank you again. Uh, Derek, I want to shift back to you. Um, obviously, we've heard big tobacco claims that menthol bans would increase the criminalization of African-American and Black communities, which we already know are already over-policed. What do you have to say to that? This is like uh, allowing the tail to wag the dog. Uh, the NAACP, several years ago, we refused to accept any money from tobacco companies uh, because of that type of deceptive marketing and messaging to our community. Uh, and I can recall some of my counterparts wanted to have a conversation, uh, making the argument that if of uh, your bad menthol, it would increase police harassment of young men selling Lucy's on the corner. And I thought that was one, one of the most asinine arguments I could have ever heard. Uh, because if, you, if you're serious about addressing the issue of menthol, put the penalty on the company, not the young people. That's how that can get addressed. And immediately they want to shift the conversation. This is a conversation that we must have because as companies and corporations, uh, particularly tobacco companies, seek to have deceptive marketing practices, targeting our communities to increase profit, causing more harm uh, in our communities, we must push back with clear voices. There, is, there isn't a, a, enough money for any of our organizations to receive for the damage that's being done. Derek, I couldn't agree with you more. And I see, I see Dr. Jeffries, Laird, and Carol both shaking their heads. So I want to bring you in and see if you have anything to add um, yes. to Derek's comments. Yes, I, I would love to add. Um, first of all, I'm a former president of Berkeley, California, um, of the NACP and a very proud member, working on my lifetime membership, uh, President Johnson. And that uh, this resolution that he's talking about came from California. So the, the, the legislation and the, and the laws that we're working to pass, they are about the retailer. They're not about the individual. Nobody's going to stop a black man at the bus stop and ask him if he has a menthol cigarette or a non-mentholated cigarette. It's about interrupting the supply from these multinational companies. And at the same time, we're working to decrease demand because you can't have uh, people still addicted to these products without offering them services. So those things work hand in hand and that we're in this because we love our people. We love our black smokers. My oldest brother is a, a Newport smoker and I will never get out and march for him to have a product that's killing him. Uh, as Dr. McDougall talked about earlier, that will end him up with amputations and, and health. I'm going to fight for him to have services and I'm going to affirm that he can stop smoking because other people stop smoking and we can too. So this is not about the criminalization of our community. The criminals are the tobacco industry. And so we're not going to let the industry 
who's 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 predated us and and had used racist profiling to addict us to now flip that flip the script and say oh no to take these products offline is racist against black people and they're going to have more officer involved profiling and killings that's something that we have to deal with and through organizations like the NAACP our, the oldest civil rights organization in our country those are issues that we have to solve and that have nothing to do with unfortunately Eric Gardner who who was killed selling loose cigarettes he was killed because of of, of racism and police brutality not because of what he was doing in that moment and that's we have to keep those things separate and work on both of them at the same time. Dr. Jeffrey Leonard. You know, I, I just want to say that, first of all, I, I, I'm so proud of the work that the Connect and Link uh, Derek Johnson is doing and, and the work that, that, that the organizations on this, this call are doing tonight. And, and, and Sister Bria, I mean, she said a word. This is a social justice issue. We have been targeted. We have been racially profiled, as, as has been said, for so many, many, many years by Big Tobacco. And so we're proud to be able to sign on to legislation and have an advocacy agenda that addresses these kinds of issues. When you take these things off of the market, out of the hands, then you don't have the, 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 the health issues that you have, the, the, the criminalization issues that you have. Um, so, so we feel that um, it is a target. And, and we have been targeted and it does set us up for all of the issues that you're seeing and that we're talking about health, economic, um, criminalization, all of these things are, are and, and, and it feels like it has been um, kind of in play for such a long time. The fact that some of us have been in this field for so long that we're afraid to even tell how long we've been in here because then we're going to age ourselves. I mean, I remember the coupons. I don't know if you all do. If you have so many, yes. then you get a free set of dishes. We're still dealing with the same kinds of issues that we have been. I think we're making some progress, but it is just now how else can we get to the black community? So now we've got the vaping. Oh, it's a better cigarette. It's a better way to do this. We've got electric e-cigarettes. All of these things are targeted for the same reason for, um, at the same people. And we just got to uh, put the kinds of policies in place to be able to eradicate all of this. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jeffries Leonard, I think you brought up a great point about the vaping, the e-cigarettes, and putting obviously policies in place that speak to all this. Bria, I want to circle back to you when you think about the work that you're doing with the Truth Initiative and on the ground on at HBCU campuses. Talk to us about what type of advice or what are you hearing from young people and what can adults do as us being adults to help young people from ever picking up tobacco? Yes, I think first, a lot of people on this talk today have um, explained the first thing I would say very well is that it is we should not personally attack or put the blame on younger people for the habits that they have developed. It is something that has a lot of different, there are a lot of different reasons why somebody wait, may begin to smoke. Maybe they started a lot of young people I know now today, maybe started with vaping and then they move into cigarettes or maybe it was for a type of social interaction as young people were very social. These types of things may be harder to quit or we may be more encouraged to start because it connects us to people our age. So you have to understand that we have we don't necessarily need to be told you're wrong, you're gonna be unhealthy. Those facts are good and they're important, but you also have to show a level of empathy too as you're sharing them and to be able to go alongside people as they are either trying to quit or maybe finding alternatives for stress relief, finding alternatives to connect with other people, maybe if they're not feeling that they're finding their place in a, in a space, whether that be school, whatever it may be. And so I would say, yes, definitely know that empathy is needed. Know that continuing to share the facts, people my age, we like to know the truth. You don't have to sugarcoat it. You know, you don't have to not give it to us straight, but you also have to know that there's more to it for why somebody may be struggling, even though they may know the facts. And um, I think some great things I love about truth is that they have different ways, such as their um, texting program to learn to quit. It's something that is connecting with people our age and, you know, other things where we can share through videos that Truth has and other things like that. But, you know, just being able to listen and know that peer pressure is real and that those social connections and those things that we're going through, it may not be the stress that an adult is going through, but it's the stress. It's the only stress we know and it can be hard to bear. So that's a big reason why they may be dealing with struggling to smoke or quit smoking. 
Right. No, no, Bria, I, I think that's spot on. The empathy piece is big, right? Being empathetic, understanding that everybody has their own personal journey and they each have their own reason for, for, for using tobacco. And so I think we have to understand and be sensitive to that. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, uh, President you. Johnson, let's circle back with you. And you, you mentioned about obviously NAACP rejecting big tobacco. How do we get other community leaders to commit to rejecting big tobacco in their, in their money? You know, I can only speak for NAACP. I think forums like this where we can educate people to understand the harm that this industry has created in our community. Uh, that's one. Two, uh, depend on the makeup of the organization. We are we are governed by our members. We are like a Baptist church. We're led from the pews. And and there was an effort successfully uh, where our delegates said, we don't want uh, to take big tobacco money. And that was in the 90s. Uh, we've come around since then and said, we also need to ban flavored tobacco because the research is out there. It's very clear. It, we've been targeted. We've been marketed to for an, an addictive chemical so that it could cause harm and others make profit. That's not a way to have a corporate relationship. And if a corporate relationship is abusive, like any relationship, you have to end, any, end it immediately. And we decided that for the NAACP, and I will hope other African-American focused groups would do the same. No, no. Thank you, President Johnson. And, and Dr. Jeffries Leonard, I know you're, you're obviously super involved in the HBCU space. What role can HBCUs play in the tobacco control movement? Well, we're, we're very fortunate. Um, we know that the HBCUs are really such an important connection to our community. Um, they really are the training ground for so many of our young people. And I want to shout out to, to Bria for being a uh, a graduate, I'm a graduate of three, but we're very fortunate in the links that we have eight presidents who are links. I just want to make sure that I name them here. Uh, Dr. Ivy Ruth Taylor, she's the president of Russ College, and Dr. Rosalind Clark Artis is the president of Benedict College. Uh, Dr. Kerry Dixon, the president of Elizabeth City State University. Dr. Glenda Glover, who is the president of Tennessee State University. Dr. Varel Bennett Fairs, uh, president of Lemoyne Owen. Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett, the president of Houston Tillerson. Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, who is the president of Morehouse School of Medicine. And Dr. Carmen Walters, who's the president of Tougaloo College. And all of them really help weigh in on, on, on uh, what we were talking about because they all have really robust programs that engage their students um, and have policies on their campuses um, to address tobacco use. Um, I know that um, um, that one of uh, the Dr. Waters, uh, Walters from Tougaloo, they're part of the um, the Jackson study uh, with that, that, that tracks the student use of tobacco and its impact on heart disease. It's probably the, one of the largest studies of its kind. Um, I know that um, at Elizabeth City State University, um, they have um, they have facilitated peer to peer, very much like the Truth Campaign, uh, the Truth Ambassadors of students who are working directly with students to help alleviate uh, tobacco use. Um, I know at Morehouse School of Medicine, um, you know, not only uh, putting cessation programs in place and, and, and facilitating that from a medical perspective, because you know these are the the um, health professionals that are going to go out into the to the um, communities. But but in, a, in addition to our other, I mean, Houston Tillerson has had a policy has been up since 2011. Um, so but all of our HBCUs um, that that I mentioned, and I know, um, broadly, um, they really are the foundation to be able to um, have students who are going to be the the connectors to our community who are going to be those those ambassadors to our community when we educate our students and help them understand how they're being targeted how our communities have historically been targeted and they in turn um, educate them their their peers their families uh, because we're talking about intergenerational use of these things we know how that looks then that allows us to be able to really help make a turn and help you know impact tobacco use um, across the black community intergenerationally. Um, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but our, our HBCUs really do play that pivotal role in helping to get these messages out, helping to put programs in place and really helping to turn the tide on this. HBCUs play such a powerful role and I, and I wanna thank you all and I wanna leave Carol for any, any final remarks before we uh, bring back Portia. 
Okay, I just wanted to make sure that people are aware that the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council is actually suing the FDA for their inaction on menthol. Uh, the science is clearly in. Their own uh, reports uh, state that taking menthol will benefit the public health, and our co plaintiffs are Action on Smoking and Health, the American Medical Association, and more importantly, the National Medical Association. So our black doctors are with us. And there was a question about where, which side the FDA was going to come down on. So we know science is about politics from our experience with COVID this past year. So we need the continued support of our leadership groups like Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the first group to come out nationally to say, get these products out of our community. Then our National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, and we have other national groups, our, our new Center for uh, Black Health Equity. So we need the continued leadership of our groups to weigh in on this and to be there and to say, we want these products offline and we want the support for our community. And, 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 and the tobacco industry, who should pay for all this stuff? They should, because they have harmed us. And there's when we talk about reparations, um, we need some reparations for the predation of the African-American community by the tobacco industry. So that's, a, that's a, another conversation for another time. But we're, we welcome support. Our website is savingblacklives.org. Want to thank Campaign, want to thank Portia, the excellent leadership. And it's been my honor to be on the panel with all of you today. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you, Carol Magruder, uh, Bria Campbell, Kimberly uh, Jeffries Leonard, uh, Derek Johnson. Thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And we have such a dynamic conversation. I just want to thank you all for allowing me to moderate and, and kind of navigate this conversation. Heard from some dynamic leaders. And I think. The one takeaway uh, that I took was that we are all in this collective action. A unified front is what we need to really uh, collectively move forward and make a difference. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Portia Reddick White back to the stage for some final remarks. Portia. Thank you, John. Uh, this has really been an exciting, timely conversation, right? Bottom line is just what Carol just said, actually, the FDA needs to act. They have the authority to prohibit menthol cigarettes, but they've repeatedly failed to do so, despite their own scientific conclusions that prohibiting menthol cigarettes would benefit public health. So before we close, I just want to thank all of our participants and thank their organizations, the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, Black Women's Health Imperative, the National Medical Association, the NAACP, the Lynx Incorporated, Lincoln Monday, Bria Campbell, and John Burns of the Burns Brothers for taking the time to share with us all the history, the direct viewpoints and guidance on how the black community, all generations can engage together to protect the health of black Americans and save lives. And we wanna thank you for joining us. The Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids ask you to join us in calling on that Food and Drug Administration, the FDA to use its authority to ban menthol cigarettes and other flavored tobacco products. We're going to continue to push Congress as well as states and cities all across the country to take action. And we would like to ask you to join us to do that as well. For more information on how you can be involved, please go to our website at tobaccofreekids.org. We invite you to our next campaign for the culture conversation in April, where we will once again bring together organizations and voices who stand with us in stopping the tobacco industry from targeting and pushing their harmful products in black and brown communities. We invite youth to join us on April Fool's Day for a night of comedy and empowerment to show Big Tobacco we won't be fooled any longer by their tactics. Please go to our website for more information at takedowntobacco.org. Until next time, thank you for joining us. Good evening.